Hi everyone and welcome to our little video on biological classification. So this is the first video in our little classification series and what we're going to be doing in this one is having a look at two specification references 4.2.2a the biological classification of species with those different taxonomic hierarchies and then 2.2.2b which is the binomial system of naming species. First thing then, let's consider why we actually bother to go through this whole process of classifying organisms. And basically we've got three key ideas here. First one is that it makes this study of living things that is biology way more manageable. Secondly, it's going to make it easier for us to identify these organisms. And finally, it's going to help us to identify relationships between these different species. It basically helping us to make sense of the amazing diversity that we do have here on planet Earth. First thing that we need to know about when it comes to classifying are these taxonomic levels. And there are eight taxonomic levels that we need to know in order to be able to classify all of these organisms. So the first one comes out of the work carried out by a guy called Wose, and he came up with this domain model. And there are three domains that exist. So the first one is going to be the archaea, which are kind of the best way to describe it is like the extreme bacteria. Think about those ones that live in these deep sea thermal vents and the like. We then have our eubacteria, so these are our modern bacteria as we know them today, and then the eukaryotes are obviously eukaryotic organisms. So what we find is this domain is the highest taxonomic rank, and therefore within each of these three domains are quite a diverse range of organisms still. Because if you imagine every living thing on planet Earth being split into one of those three categories, archaea, eubacteria or eukaryotes, it's quite big still. Before we move away from these three domains, let's have a little look at a bit more information about each of them. So the archaea then, these are prokaryotic organisms. So remember, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. Now, these are the ones that we first discovered living in those extreme environments that I've mentioned. And they're really quite similar to bacteria, but they have some unique properties that means it made sense to split them off from the other bacteria. And we're going to look at three of these unique properties. First one is that in their cell membranes, they actually have quite unique lipids compared to other bacteria. Their cell walls do not contain peptidoglycan. And finally, the ribosomes are actually more similar to those of the eukaryotes than the other bacteria themselves. So because we've got these unique lipids in their membranes, no peptidoglycan in their cell walls and ribosomes, which are more similar to eukaryotic ones than our typical prokaryotic, then it really made sense to create this domain of the archaea. Our second little domain is the eubacteria. These are prokaryotic cells. And as I've said, they're pretty much like the bacteria that you commonly think about. So all of your E. coli, salmonella, etc. These are all in the domain of U bacteria. In terms of our final domain, the eukaryote, then these are obviously eukaryotic cells and a diverse group. We have everything from the single cells of things like euglena all the way up to the huge organisms like blue whales. So single cells to large multicellular organisms, but the key thing is that they are made of eukaryotic cells. Therefore, they have a nucleus. Once we move away from our domain model, then we're coming on to the seven different classifications that we can use that came about from the time of Linnaeus. Now, the first one of these is the kingdom. So we have five kingdoms that all of these organisms on Earth will be split up into. Plantae, Animalia, Protoctista, Fungi and Prokaryote. So what we can actually do is all of these five kingdoms are still quite diverse, 
but they have some unique features that we need to know about. We then come on to the phylum. Now, the phylum is a group of organisms that all have the same body plan. And we'll look more at body plan when it comes to module six. Basic idea at this stage, though, is that our body plans give us the basic pattern of the body of the organism. So the amount of segmentation, the number of limbs, etc. The next taxonomic level is the class. And here, the organisms within the same class all possess the same general traits. We then come down to the order. And this is where we're splitting them into smaller groups using some of that additional information about each of these organisms. Family comes next, and these are closely related genera. Genus is our next little category, and this is where we've got closely related species. Which brings us to our final taxonomic level of the species. Now, the species is obviously meaning we have a single organism, but in that species, we're going to have a range of different members and they're going to demonstrate a certain degree of variation. But to all intents and purposes, they are the same. Now, a pretty typical question when it comes to these taxonomic levels is having a little look at a little table, something like this, which will then have bits missing. So what we've given you here is just the humans full classification using all their different taxonomic ranks. And we can see that as far as humans go, the kingdom is Animalia. Hopefully you knew that. Phylum, Chordata, all have a basically a spinal cord here. Class, Mammalia, mammals. Order, primate. Family, Hominidae. Genus is Homo. And the species, Sapiens. So what we've got here is the full taxonomic classification of humans. One thing to look out for in the type of questions that come up here is they'll give you a table of some random creature and then there will be certain parts from this area, the taxonomic rank that will be missing. It's going to be in order. So as long as you know the sequence of those taxonomic ranks, you can fill it in. Now, my best advice is to work out some fun filled little rhyme that's going to help you to remember these. I won't share the one that I always use with my sixth form because it's probably not appropriate, but you can come up with anything you like. Use the first letter of each of those words, come up with something that sticks in your head and use it. The last thing we need to know then is how we can then create a name, this binomial name. Now, if we break the word binomial down into the two parts, bi quite simply means two and nomial means name. So we have a two name system. And the two names that we are using will be the genus and the species. When we are writing these nice little binomial names, we do need to adhere to a couple of rules. First one is that whenever you're writing down the genus, you must put a capital letter at the start. So genus always has a capital. Species must all be lowercase. So when we're literally writing these binomial names, you've got to stick to those rules. And I have seen a multiple choice question in the past where they basically gave you a selection of incorrect binomial names. And in some cases, you were able to identify and eliminate some of the wrong answers because what we were looking for was the genus and the species, obviously. Genus having a capital letter, species lowercase. If they were both lowercase, then it was wrong. So you can use that as a quick check for those. But whenever you're writing it, genus capital, species lowercase. Technically, if you're writing a binomial name, you should either write it in italics or underline them, but you're not going to be penalised about that on an exam paper. So good practice, but not something we would penalise in marking for. In terms of what this binomial system is using for those names, it's Latin. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, why on earth are we using a dead language to name all these weird and wonderful creatures of the world? Well, it because it gives it a universal name. No one uses Latin in everyday language anymore, but 
it does give us this one universal name, a universal language that we can use to talk about all organisms. So that means that someone whose first language is French and someone whose first language is Spanish, they can actually communicate very effectively and know what they're talking about because they're both using the Latin binomial name. If we didn't use this universal name in Latin, we would end up with quite a lot of confusion when it came to writing about organisms because different regions of the world and even different regions of your own country have different common names for an organism. Good example there is the old woodlouse, which in some regions of the world is called a pea bug. So you might write a wonderful paper about the amazing properties of the pea bug. You would publish it and someone on the other side of the world would be sitting there thinking, wow, this pea bug is so similar to my woodlouse. This must be some strange anomaly that's made them so similar. They're the same creature. They just have a different common name. We also would find the different languages would be translated in different ways. I'm sure you know this from any language work you've done at school when we're trying to translate things. It's not quite perfect. So when we translate it to different languages, we'd end up with weird and wonderful names of things leading to more confusion. And obviously we can find the same common name could be used for different species in different regions. So just because someone is referring to a woodlouse as a pea bug doesn't mean that somewhere else in the world that there could be a completely different species that someone calls a pea bug because it looks like a pea for some reason. So be mindful of those little complexities that we can avoid by using this Latin binomial name. As always, I do suggest that you subscribe to the channel so you can see when another video is uploaded. And of course, head on over to the A-Level Biology website where you can find a whole range of other resources designed to help you in your biology studies.